Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to Into the Deep, our monthly series of lectures for seeking disciples. My name is Sister Angela Marie Castellani. I'm a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist, and I serve as the coordinator for adult faith formation and catechesis for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And with me tonight is also Luisa Gitz, our um, assistant coordinator who is serving tonight behind the scenes. After our wonderful summer and our break, we're so excited to be back with all of you tonight. Inspired by the results of the Synod on Synodality in the Archdiocese of Vancouver, and also by the apostolic letter that our Holy Father Pope Francis wrote on the liturgy, Into the Deep will dedicate four sessions on the theme of the liturgy. So from tonight to December, we will invite speakers to share with us um, about the liturgy. We have entitled this a series of lectures, Make Every Sunday Matter, from one of our Archidiocesan uh, priorities. So tonight we'll begin with the first one, and our, um, our structure will be a little bit different uh, since we have invited many of you to attend uh, live from your own parishes, and some of our parishes are streaming live into the deep tonight. We have decided to offer some questions and reflection questions for you at the end of each session so that you could discuss them and talk about uh, what you have learned throughout the night with your brothers and sisters around you who are gathering together at your parishes. Those questions will also be available for all our attendees who are still faithfully uh, joining us from home. Uh, tonight, we celebrate the Feast of St. Padre Pio, a lover of the Eucharist, one of the greatest saints of our church, one of the most well-known saints at this time in our um, uh, century. So I would like to begin with a beautiful prayer that he used to uh, recite after communion. So there will be a slide up for you to follow up with me as we begin this prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stay with me, Lord, because I am weak, and I need your strength, that I may not fall so often. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my life, and without you I am without meaning and hope. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my light, and without you I am in darkness. Stay with me, Lord, to show me your will. Stay with me, Lord, so that I can hear your voice and follow you. Stay with me, Lord, for I desire to love you evermore and to be always in your company. Stay with me, Lord, if you wish me to be always faithful to you. Stay with me, Lord, for as poor as my soul is, I wish it to be a place of consolation for you and dwelling of your love. Stay with me, Jesus, for it is getting late. The days are coming to a close and life is passing. Death, judgment, and eternity are drawing near. It is necessary to renew my strength so that I will not stop along the way for that I need you. It is setting late and death approaches. I fear darkness, the temptations, the dryness, the cross, the sorrow. Oh, how I need you, my Jesus, in this night of exile. Stay with me, Jesus, because in the darkness of life, with all its dangers, I need you. Help me to recognize you as your disciples did in the breaking of the bread so that the Eucharist, Eucharist communion be the light which disperses darkness, the power which sustains me, the unique joy of my heart. Stay with me, Lord, because at the hour of my death, I want to be one with you, and if not by communion, at least, at least by your grace and love. Stay with me, Jesus. I do not ask for divine consolations, because I do not deserve them, but I only ask for the gift of your presence. Oh yes, I ask this of you. 
Stay with me, Jesus, for I seek you alone. Your love, your grace, your will, your heart, your spirit, because I love you and I ask for no other reward but to love you more and more with a strong, active love. Grant that I may love you with my whole heart while on earth so that I can continue to love you perfectly throughout all eternity, dear Jesus. Saint Padre Pio, pray for us. So our first session tonight is entitled Seeing Things as They Are, Liturgy as Living. And our presenter, and I'm very, very excited to introduce you to Dr. Andrew Kittler. Dr. Andrew is the academic dean and assistant professor of theology at Catholic Pacific College. He has authored several publications and leaves and uh, works uh, in uh, Alder Grove, again, at Catholic Pacific College. His wife and six children are also with him uh, present in our diocese. So we're very, very excited to introduce you to Dr. Andrew, who will give this presentation and also give the following two presentations in October and November. Uh, while we're not getting you to ask questions tonight, we encourage you though to put questions in the chat box. Our fourth and last session for this series will be a panel discussion, and we will gather questions from throughout the recordings um, of the three previous sessions. So please do ask your questions and we will build the panel discussion at the end for the December session, according to the questions that have come in. So welcome to all of you tonight. Welcome Dr. Kittler and thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you, sister. It's a great privilege to be here. Now that should be on there. Um, it's a wonderful privilege, as I said, to be here and to be able to talk about the liturgy, something dear to my heart. And, and tonight, um, what I really want to do is dive deep into sacramentality. And this provides the context for us to, to really think about liturgy and what the Holy Father has given us with his recent document. Uh, th this lecture uh, or talk uh, really helps set a foundation for the next few talks. And so uh, bear with me, it, we will have to uh, jump into some pretty uh, complicated stuff, but I hope I can explain it in, in a really clear way. So let's begin here. I'm gonna, there we go. Okay. So liturgy in life living to the fullest, go hand in hand. These are so bound up in each other that the liturgical theologian Aidan Kavanaugh wrote that liturgy is doing the world as it was meant to be done. But what does liturgy have to do with the world? And what does the world have to do with liturgy? So often these, same, these appear to be so disparate, so separate from each other. But really, the short answer is it has to do with everything. Now, most of you tonight are most likely catechized Catholics. And if I were to ask you a simple question, how many sacraments are there? You would clearly say seven. Baptism, confirmation, chrismation, Eucharist, confession, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. And this is true. And yet, there is much more to this. There's an overarching context that makes sense of this, which is namely sacramentality. If we want to have a full, a full understanding of the sacraments, then we need to see the world sacramentally. I put full understanding in air quotes because sacraments are a mystery that we contemplate. And when we contemplate something, it's something that's mysterious and therefore always exceeds us. We can never exhaust it. We never come to the end of it. So it's not a once and for all, here it is, here's a sacrament, I got it. No, we will spend all our life um, diving deep into these great mysteries. 
Now, it is true that without an understanding of the sacramentality of the world, you would understand something about the seven sacraments. For example, you could say that baptism is the first sacrament. It's the sacrament of initiation. It's the chief sacrament of forgiveness of sins. It welcomes us into the church, into the body of Christ. Nevertheless, we would fail to understand why baptism requires actions, words, and material. Why water? In addition, we'd fail to see how baptism relates to the everyday workaday world. Perhaps the best way of explaining this would be with a metaphor. A young father one day takes his son aside, opens up his toolbox and pulls out hammer, big shiny hammer. His young son looks at this magnificent tool with total glee. It's shiny, it's heavy, and it looks dangerous, and therefore it's rather exciting. He quickly reaches out for the hammer, but the father pulls it back and tells the boy that first he must show him how to use it. He takes him into the backyard where there's an old stump, and lying beside the stump is a pile of nails. He sets down the hammer, the stump and the nails and then step by step he begins explaining the hammer to his son how to hold the hammer how to swing the tool how to hit the nail and he demonstrates ouch you know expletives loudly shouted the father jumps up and down and then he tells his son what not to say when he hits his fingers a, a sort of uh, do as i say not as i do moment another lesson for the child but after the lesson he leaves the young son to practice hitting the nails in this log, in this stump. And the boy does this for hours, loving every mo moment of it, perhaps a few sore fingers. The next day, the young boy, he brings his best friend over to his house. He brings him into the backyard. He shows him the hammer and nails and the stump that he's nailing into. His best friend, caught up in the excitement of the shiny object in front of him, oohs and ahs, wow, hammer, nails. And then looking perplexed, he turns and he asks, what is it for? The young boy responds, for smacking nails into the stump in the backyard, of course. Now, on one hand, the boy's right. This is true, this is something you can do, but it's certainly not the whole picture. It is not until the boy can look at his family house and realize that the frame of the house is put together with hammer and nails. Of course, now we have these fancy you know, air hammers and so forth, but bear with me. That the hardwood floor is hammered down, that the crown molding is hammered and nailed into place and so forth. It's only then that he really begins to understand what a hammer and nail are for. And of course, we can add that a hammer, the nail, is what pinned our Lord to a cross. There is nothing that is not in relation with Jesus Christ, the Logos. Everything is in relation with him. And this is why Pope Francis writes, Peter and John were sent to make preparations to eat that Passover. But in actual fact, all of creation, all of history, which at last was on the verge of re revealing itself as the history of salvation, was a huge preparation for that supper. A huge preparation for that supper. When we recognize this, and bear in mind this requires a lifetime of formation, then we'll see how the liturgy is the apogee, the highest point of Christian existence, and why Kavanaugh could write that liturgy is doing the world as it was meant to be done. This also works in the inverse. When we have spiritually attuned eyes to see the mass, we will also be able to see the world aright. In tonight's talk, I want to talk about the sacramentality of reality.
and we can put this in a different way. I want to talk about mediation. From mediation, I want to talk about symbols, another way of conceiving of sacramentality. And finally, I'll bring this all together and answer the question set out at the beginning. What does liturgy have to do with the world? And what does the world have to do with liturgy? That is, I'll answer it better than just saying everything. Okay, here we go. Often, the simplest questions are the hardest to answer. I remember tucking in my, my oldest daughter, uh, my only daughter at the time, um, or I guess I had a second, she was quite young, but my, my oldest daughter was two years old. We were living in Lithuania. And one night I'm tucking her into bed, we're lying there and there was this nice big window out in front of her bed that you could look outside and we were cuddled up there and looking out the window and talking. And um, my, my daughter impressed me as a, as a theologian. I was very impressed by this. She said, Daddy, is God in this room? Great question. Yeah, yeah, God's in this room. Daddy, is God also in the sky? Yeah, 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 he's in the sky too. You could say that. And then she asked the philosophical doozy, Daddy, how can God be in two places at once? Oh, shoot. I said, well, don't worry about it. When you're old enough, you can go and read St. Thomas Aquinas, and then this will all come clear. <laughs> but, but would it? Now, the sort of funny thing is she was deeply worried that if God was also in the sky and her room, that she was going to pull on her feet at night and disturb her sleep. I, I assured her that was okay. But anyway, we had the makings of a, of a theologian there. And this question that she raised, this in a way very basic, but super complex question. These are the questions of theology. And St. Thomas Aquinas, this great genius, liked to ask these most basic questions. One that he repeated over and over again in his life, what is God? Now we're not gonna attempt to answer either of these related questions. But the point is that we're never too old, never too smart to ask what appears to be basic questions. Nor are we ever beyond returning to basic definitions. Because again and again, and you'll see this in, in scholarly writing, people return to the etymology, to the origin of a word to make sense of something. And there's so much richness to words that help us. So with this in mind, I want to ask, what is a sacrament? What is a sacrament? Well, you probably memorized some of these answers. Let's give you a, a response from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. A sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace. So that's grace that's effective, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church, by which divine life is dispensed to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. The first part, as I said, hey, it's talking about the signs are effective. They do what they say. They really change us. They, they have the power to transform us. The last part, which I'll read again, by which divine life is dispensed to us through the work of the Holy Spirit, is the most helpful for us tonight. Let me rephrase it in the following way. A sacrament brings together. A sacrament brings together. What is it bringing together? Well, in short, God and man, God and the human person. We'll come back to this. Okay, where does the word sacrament come from? Here comes the etymology side. It is a cognate of the Latin word sacramentum. And sacramentum is a Latin word for the Greek word mysterion. There's a, I think there's a superhero called Mysterion. This is much better than the superhero. The other Latin word that comes out of Mysterion is Mysterium. And clearly you can see both in the Greek and this Latin translation, Mysterium, uh, the English cognate for mystery, or not for, but English cognate, mystery. Okay. So we can accurately refer 
to the sacraments as the mysteries. Hence, one contemplates the mysteries, again, something mysterious, we can't hold in the mysterious, we can't pen it in, we can't circumscribe them, so we contemplate them. Or more simply, one ponders the sacraments, but we never get to the bottom of them. The next question we must ask is, what does the word mysterion refer to, or mysterium, or sacramentum? What does it refer to? Well, it actually comes from the writings of St. Paul, and it refers back to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the mysterion. He is the great mystery. The infinite one become finite. The eternal one become historical. The creator, who, so to speak, became creation. And Sometimes we need to defamiliarize, make unfamiliar to ourselves the things that we've held for so long. When we think of this, this is absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, the Danish philosopher uh, Soren Kierkegaard would say that this is so absurd, the incarnation, that God became man, that it must be true. Because who could come up with something like this? It's so fantastic. And I mean that in a best way possible. Jesus Christ is the infinite one become finite. We will never get to the bottom of Jesus Christ, but he gets to the bottom of us. We will lovingly contemplate the mystery of Jesus Christ for all eternity, yet we'll never be able to circumscribe him. Jesus Christ is the great mystery. Now, one of the interesting things about mystery is that it's something that is both visible and invisible. It's both hidden and it's revealed. That is, to know that something is a mystery is to already know something about it. There's something that we're pointing to that is a mystery. In other words, revelation revealing of something, the showing of something, and mystery, they're not opposites, they're not antonyms, but rather they go together. Jesus Christ is the revelation of God. So when we see Jesus, we see God. The Son of God became man so that we could see him, touch him, eat and drink with him, so that he could eat and drink with us. Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Let us not forget that we didn't call God down from heaven. Rather, his love is so great that he sought us and became man. He's the great lover who woos us. He's the hound of God who searches and knows me and is acquainted with all my ways. Joseph Ratzinger liked to speak about Christ coming so near to us that he became obscure. He became a second century bearded Jewish fellow. He did not glow. He didn't have a halo around his head. He looked like a Jewish man, just like every other Jewish man around him. And this is why he was mocked and crucified. He looked like an ordinary man who's claiming to be God. On the other hand, his incarnation, his human existence, which is ongoing, the Son of God remains fully God and fully man, is also what linked us to God. So the famous uh, statement by Athanasius and Irenaeus, God became man so that man may become God. Jesus Christ is for us. He is the way and he is the end. And in him, the infinite and the finite unite. He is the finite and the infinite united. Fully God, fully man. He's also the way in which the finite and the infinite are united. As the mysterion, Jesus Christ is the root 
of all the mysteries. The Eucharist is a sacrament par excellence because it is Christ himself. The other sacraments are the overflow of Christ's grace and all lead into the Eucharist, to the sacramental Christ. The sacraments are the tangible means by which God touches us, bringing us into the heart of the Trinitarian dance, so to speak. Okay, so now that we've set out the Christological foundation of the sacraments and brought to the fore mystery, let's broaden this and turn to mediation. Clearly, I hope, in what I've just said, we can see that Jesus Christ is the mediator. And if you want more liturgical language, of course, you can turn to this wonderful book of Hebrews. Jesus is the high priest, the mediator between man and God. There is no other high priest. There is only Christ. He is the sole and exclusive mediator between man and God. But listen really carefully to this next bit. While being the exclusive mediator, he does not wield his mediation exclusively. Once again, while being the exclusive mediator, he does not mediate exclusively. He shares his mediation. So if we turn to scripture, we turn to 1 Timothy, it says the following. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as the ransom for all, the testimony to which was born at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and telling truth, not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. In this very passage, we see mediation. We see it when the writer, the author, Paul, writes, the testimony to which was born at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a, a preacher and apostle. Okay. St. Paul effectively is saying, I am a mediator of this message. Let's unpack this a little more. Bear in mind, Jesus Christ is not created, but is the begotten Son of God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, as we recite every Sunday. In John's Gospel, he, he is referred to in its opening as the Logos. Great opening text, right? In the beginning was the Logos, the Word. He is the Word of God. And, and Logos has, is multivalent, has all sorts of meanings to it. Um, but one of these aspects of Logos is that he's meaning itself. And what, what the, the, the writer's getting at, what John's getting at, is that uh, the sun, the Logos, is the ground of all being. He holds everything into existence. Um, he is the word of God, ground of all being. As the Logos, he underpins all reality. He's the mediator of all creation and the mediator of salvation. We see that in, in the incarnation. Now we'll come back to this idea of creation, but let's begin with the Son being the mediator of salvation. If you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, it begins with the genealogy of Christ. We find genealogies throughout the biblical text, and usually they're very frustrating, especially when you read a book such as Joshua, and you can't pronounce most of the names, uh, and you wonder what they're here for. Well, in the Gospels, they're actually really theologically, they're replete with meaning. And, uh, and, and much has been written about these, and if you, if you want more on this, you could read... Uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict's, um, one of his volumes on Jesus, on the infancy narratives, 
and um, I think it's volume three, and, and he unpacks these a little more. But all I want to say, if we look at this, ge this genealogy in Matthew, he gives us a list of names, and they highlight two people, Abraham and David. And from here, they work their way forward towards Joseph and Mary. So, okay, key figure, Abraham, and we have David, um, and then we have Joseph and Mary. Boom, here comes Jesus. Jesus doesn't just drop out of the sky. He comes in this lineage of people. It's a long line of predecessors. Each one of these predecessors is mediating the mediator, reaching its climax, of course, with Jesus Christ, but the ultimate mediator being Our Lady, Mary. Uh, and this is why in the fifth century, we find the title given to her Mediatrix or Mediatrix, um, because she is the one that so perfectly brings God into the world. She births him, literally. The next gospel, Mark, begins with a quote from Isaiah, the prophet, and then moves immediately to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, he pronounces, this is right on Mark, he says, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Isaiah the prophet, we read, of course, Isaiah during Christmas, we're talking about incarnation. And John the Baptist are mediating, okay? They're mediating figures. They're participating in Christ's mediation. Think about uh, John, John um, the Baptist and in all, so many of the pieces of, of art, especially by the crucifix, you often have John the Baptist looking at you doing this, pointing towards uh, the Christ. He's mediating Christ. Okay. Luke's gospel begins with Zachariah, Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. Now, Zachariah is a priest, so he's one who mediates God. That is what a priest does, after all. He and Elizabeth give birth to John, who continues the mediation of his father, a different sort of mediation, not as priest, but as this forerunner, as the last figure, in a sense, in a way, the last Old Testament figure pointing towards Christ. Points, and he gets to point directly to Jesus. In Luke's third chapter, we're given another genealogy, beginning from Joseph and working back to Adam, the son of God. It's a literal what it says in, in Luke 3.38, Adam, the son of God. Here, we see a direct correlation, a direct line from Joseph to the very work of God, Adam. That is, God is mediating, mediating himself from Adam all the way to the new Adam, to the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Now, this is neat stuff, um, fascinating and all, but is this unique? No, this is how God usually operates. In fact, it fits with the very nature of who God is. Mediation is the norm. It reflects his very self. The Father gives everything to the Son. The Son, the Father creates. Through the Son, he mediates his love to us. The Son, in return, gives everything back to the Father. Through the Spirit, the Son brings us, mediates us, to the Father. If all creation mysteriously then reflects its creator, who is relation, who is mediating, then mediation should be seen everywhere, most notably, of course, in the sacraments themselves, mediation par excellence. So think of um, marriage, a mediation of Christ's love for the church. Hence, St. John Paul II wrote, every marriage is an act of prophecy. Each married person 
is a prophetic utterance of Christ's love for the world. We're mediating Christ's love for his bride, well, really for his church, for his bride. Now, think of the priest, okay? We've moved from marriage now to priest, who mediates the mysteries to us, each of us, forming the body of Christ, the church. Now, we often, unfortunately and mistakenly, think of priests as sort of an accoutrement, an addition to, to our life of faith. But this is only because we fail to think in line with mediation, the sacramentality. The priest, in fact, is the very embodiment of the logic of faith. Let me put up a quote here by D.C. Schindler. He writes, the priest is not principally a guide, teacher, aid, or facilitator of one's personal relation to God. But if he is all these things, he is nevertheless, in the very first place, the ordained means by which God communicates himself to his people, or more specifically, the means by which Christ disseminates the grace won through his work of redemption, which is in some basic way inseparable from his person. Schindler continues, the moment we begin to reflect on the indispensable role of the objective sacramental presence of the priest, his mediation in the manner just described, we see that it is not incidental or anomalous, but expresses the very logic of Christianity. Logic of Christianity is what? Mediation. As the Irish poet Gerard Manley Hopkins waxed eloquently, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his. Okay. The Logos also, as previously mentioned, mediates through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, writes the psalmist. Or, to return back to Hopkins, as he says in another poem, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze oil. Recognizing mediation as such is to recognize the sacramentality of the world. And here's a fantastic quote. Um, this is from Jose Granados, uh, Father Jose Granados. He writes this, touches on all this. The reason why we can receive eternal life in receiving the body of Jesus is because every fruit of the earth can already transmit in some way the life of God. Every fruit of the earth can already transmit in some way the life of God. And the reason why the Eucharistic food makes us one with Christ is because all food already in a certain way bands human beings together and situates them in the cosmos under the provident hand of the creator. From the perspective of the Eucharist, the entire material universe is revealed as a welcoming environment through its common openness to the Father and through fraternal communion. Creation thus acquires sacramental features. Creation acquires sacramental features. Okay. symbol. Perhaps this may sound to you a little sappy, but it's true. Creation is one of God's love letters to us. And if that's the case, if creation is like a letter, a word to us, we need to learn to read the world. 
I hope some of you enjoy sitting down and reading a good novel. If not, I encourage you to take up the practice. I would go so far as to say this, of course, there are always exceptions, but you cannot be a good theologian if you do not read literature, novels. Arguably, reading literature teaches us to see and how to love reality, how to see and how to love reality. Why? Well, reading literature is an act of interpreting symbols. And I don't mean the little letters on the page that you see up here on the, uh, on the screen, or maybe it's this side, I don't know where it's gonna be for you, but you know, there's an L and an I and a T and we put that together and there's symbols and we can pronounce them and make sounds. I mean it in a much bigger sense. Uh, I mean it in terms of, of the story and what it's saying. So for example, if we take Homer's The Odyssey, which begins the following way. It's such a great movie. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Now, if we read this properly, we see more than one thing set before us. Of course, the author is specifically referring us to Odysseus hero of the story. But we also need to read this, should read this, as man in the generic sense, the man of twists and turns. That's us. The human person, human person in the journey of life is twist this way and that way, sometimes losing the well-worn track of meaning. It is about man who's always seeking his home. The same story, loaded in symbolism, is seen, for example, and we can point to tons of stories. We could C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. But here, let's just quickly talk about Tolkien's, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. And the very subtitle of this book gives it away. The subtitle is There and Back Again. Like Odysseus, Bilbo Baggins, Little Hobbit, must leave his home in order to discover his home, in order to come home. He must give up his home in order to have a home given back to him. This is more than an entertaining little story. It teaches us that we must transcend ourselves in order to come home to ourselves. Bilbo has to get out of his comfort zone, learn to be virtuous, learn to give of himself before he can recognize the good of his home and recognize who he is as well. And this is the basis of the spiritual life. Die to the world so that you can appreciate the world. If we don't first die to the world, we're slaves to the world, right? We need to become kings of the world by first dying to it. In reading literature, particularly good literature, we learn to engage with symbols. Learn to engage with symbols. And the world, too, is symbolic. That is, the world has meaning. It speaks to us and points constantly beyond itself. But now we need to be a little careful in how we think of the world as symbolic, of the world that is fathered forth. We live, in a way, in an illiterate culture. That is, we live in a culture that fails to see the depths of symbolism. We live in the time and the age of scientism. Not science, science is different, but scientism. In our culture, we only typically see symbols in the weakest sense. So for example, symbols in our culture are like a finger pointing to the moon. So the finger directs our gaze. So if I point, if I say, hey, look up at the moon, you don't look at my finger, you look up at the moon. Um, once we've looked up, the pointed finger is useless. There's no point to it anymore. It's unnecessary. Looking at another example here, let's say looking at a, a lion from this perspective, from this very shallow sense of symbol, we could look at a lion and we could say, 
that's Christians, Catholics, that God is not tame. Great. Look the lion, learn that God's not tame. We can't control God. We see something of the wildness of God. Very C.S. Lewis here. Aslan is not a tame lion, right? Um, but this, this ending, I got it, okay? God's not tame, can't corral him, he's, he's wild, he's inscrutable. Got it, move on. No, that's not the Catholic way because we have a very rich notion of symbol, one that's rooted in sacramentality in the Eucharistic life. As Catholics, the lion can never be discarded. It continues to father forth something about the mystery of God. More abstractly, we'd say this. Symbols participate in the mystery that they are pointing to. Symbols participate in that which they symbolize. Therefore, our gaze can never penetrate the lion, can never circumscribe the lion, and then close and be done once and for all with contemplating the lion. The lion will always be a potent symbol that can somehow teach us something, touch deep within us something about the nature of who God is. Now, before you think this is too much to take in, let me provide another way of thinking about this um, on a bit of a, a Gerard uh, Manley Hopkins uh, kick here. So let me return back to him. Um, I'm going to complete the fragment that I mentioned earlier. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces. Acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. To the Father, through the features of men's faces. To the Father, through the features of men's faces. Great body. In simple prose, Christ makes himself present through the world and through others. And this is not a once-off encounter. See it, get it, walk away, done. No. Christ continues to play in 10,000 places because the Logos upholds, sustains all existence constantly. We do not create the universe like a watch and wind it up, put it out here and step away. No. Everything is held into being by him. And so when we probe deep enough into everything, we can see that beneath it is the mystery of the Logos. Okay, so men's faces are deep mysteries participating in the mysterion, just like creation. So for example, my wife makes Christ present to me. And this is not a one-off. She continues to make him present and will continue to make him present to me until death do us part. Likewise, your parish priest is not simply a teacher that passes on information to you. And then when you master this information, you can discard of them. See you later. Don't need you anymore, Father. No, rather the priest in his very being mediates Christ to you, me, to us all. And even on a lower level, the very poem on the screen here, or here, as a symbol mediates something in itself, a truth a truth that doesn't move out of the way, which means we can contemplate this poem for the rest of our lives. Okay. This is like, say the same thing, let's say about scripture or writings of the saints. So what does this mean practically speaking? Henri de Lubac, a great French theologian, puts this well, he writes, for the Christian whose eyes are open, there's nothing in the world that does not make God manifest. Everything in the world can lead to God. Everything, and more particularly in the first place, what constitutes our constant daily portion, work. It means all human work without distinction from the humblest household ta task to the most spiritual activity. In this order, no instrument is especially favored. 
God is at the tip of my pen, my pick and brush, my needle of my heart of my thought. Leave that up there for a moment. All life is replete with the presence of God. Now let's bring this into liturgy. All that is wrapped up in recognizing the world is sacramental. And we talk about mediation and symbol. Enable us to understand the significance of the liturgy and the symbols and the actions therein. On one hand, we can recognize this on an intellectual level. By understanding mediation and symbolism, two ways of saying the same thing, and in reading reality sacramentally, we can see the world as it was meant to be seen, as it is. This is where the title of the talk comes from, seeing things as they are. If reality is sacramental or symbolical, then clearly it makes sense of why the liturgy is so rich in symbols. The Eucharist is the symbol of all symbols. Recall that symbols participate in the reality that they point to. The Eucharist is Christ, is Christ. The Eucharist is that, the very thing which it points to. It doesn't simply participate in it, but it's full encounter with Christ. Flipping this around, symbols, oh, here we go. Si flipping this around, symbols are in coit, are not fully formed sacraments. They are small means of communion. While participating in the Logos, nevertheless, they do not perfectly express, affect, or manifest Christ in, historical, in his historical personal reality. The symbols of God's world are like an appetizer leading up to the sacrificial meal. Thus, in seeing the world sacramentally, we will more easily recognize the sacrament of sacraments. In turn, the sacrament of sacraments, the Eucharist, enables us to see the world as it is, as the grandeur of God flaming out like shook foil. Okay. Now, on the other hand, there's something going on here beyond intellectual perception. And I touched on this already when I said that the Eucharist enables us to see the world as it is. That is, the Eucharist is a personal grace that works deep within us, deep even below the intellect. The Eucharist enables us to live Eucharistically. To draw this out further, I'll turn to an Orthodox theologian who I like to spend a fair amount of time with, or at least did in the past, named Alexander Schmemann. His interpretation of the first three chapters of Genesis is really insightful and helpful in this regard. Schmemann highlights that the story of the fall is centered on food. Probably haven't read, or it's a good chance you've never read the first three chapters of Genesis focusing on the notion of food. But this is really interesting. Okay, so recall Adam and Eve are seduced, tricked, whatever you want to say. Anyway, the serpent suggests to Eve that she eats of the forbidden fruit. And Eve suggests this to Adam, and they partake of this. Now, the forbidden fruit was unlike all other fruit in the garden in that it was not a gift. It was not a gift given by God. God specifically said, you don't eat of this. It doesn't come from him. All other food was mediated by God. But by eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve did not commune with God, for it was not given by God. It didn't lead back to him. He didn't give it to them. The end of the fruit went no further than the fruit itself. Okay, now think about this in terms of symbol and mediation. The forbidden fruit was not symbolical. It didn't mediate. It's not sacramental. It didn't point beyond itself. It did not connect with God. It did not mediate God. 
The forbidden fruit, then, in this read of Genesis, is an image of the world loved for its own sake. And eating it is the image of life understood as an end in itself. Since the human person was made to be homo adorans, that is a worshiping creature, the one for whom worship is the essential act, which both posits his humanity and fulfills it, then by eating the forbidden fruit, the, the anti-communion fruit, our priestly existence in the world has fallen away from the awareness that God is all in all. In other words, with the fall, we lost sight of the sacramentality of the world. Now, bringing this all together, the fall, again, another interesting way to see this, is a fall from the symbolical or sacramental. Put it differently, we have fallen from the Eucharist to the non-Eucharist, or the Eucharistic to the non-Eucharistic. The world seen through the eyes of fallen man is an end in itself. Now, there's a wonderful book, I have it up on the screen, by David Fagerberg titled Consecrating the World. It, and in it, it sets out the etymology of the word symbol. Remember I mentioned earlier that this happens in scholarly activity. We like to look at the roots of words. This is really fascinating. He sets out the etymology of symbol and he notes that in Greek, sim means together, and baline means to throw. And he writes, in ancient Greece, an object was broken into, for example, coin or bone, to serve as a sign of mutual recognition in the future when the two pieces were symbolized. Two pieces were symbolized. Thus, symbolizing is an act of throwing together throwing together two halves. Now this is where it becomes even more interesting. Fagerberg writes, the opposite of symboline, Greek word, is diaboline, which means to throw apart. And there's one with a diabolical will, you can see the root there, diabolical, diaboline, who will strive to destroy the world's symbolic character. So of course, we're speaking of the devil, the El Diablo. The devil is the one who seeks to scatter and pull apart reality. He is the great divider, whereas God is the great symbolizer. He brings everything together. Redemption it is, after all, just that. It's bringing back together the scattered sheep. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd who throws the lost sheep of humanity onto his shoulder and carries us home, uniting us with the Father, and with each other, and for that matter, the entire creation. So Fager helps us to see this cosmic implication. Redemption is a reweaving a fragmented reality. Christ is doing this through the church. It's bringing back, is bringing back everything, all creation with him. Fagerberg then raises the following question. Okay, so this is what happens, is bringing back together, is symbolizing. But how do we put back together what the devil has divided? Is it simply just a matter of understanding correctly? In other words, can we out-educate this? If we, can we educate so we bring everything back together? If we understand the world properly, the symbolical, does that change everything? No, no. Gnosticism, special knowledge, is not going to put things back to where they ought to be. Ignorance is not the root of all our problems, although supposedly ignorance is bliss. Um, nor is it the root of the fall. Our problem lies in the will. Our wills are being corrupted, crippled, being under attack from the devil. For the world to become sacrament again, the devil must be defeated and its empty show opposed. Think of the baptismal liturgy. 
the three rejections of Satan, those empty shells. And only Christ can do this. Only Christ can defeat Satan. The Orthodox theologian Oliver Clement writes, it's a great quote, in Christ, the world is joined together again in symbol, in a profusion of symbols. The invisible part appears in the visible. The visible draws its meaning from the invisible. God transcends the intelligible as well as the visible. But through the incarnation of the Logos, he penetrates them both, transfigures and unites them. The world is a vast incarnation, which the fall of the human race tries to contradict. The Diabolos, the opposite of the Symbolon, is continually trying to keep apart the separated halves of the ring. But they come together in Christ. Christian symbolism expresses nothing less than the union in Christ of the divine and the human, of which the cosmos becomes the dialogue displaying the circulation in Christ of glory between earth and heaven, between the visible and the invisible. Christ is the one who brings together. He is symbolon. He is the coming together of divinity and humanity. Fagerberg makes a really interesting claim again. I keep saying this really interesting because this book is really interesting. And he just said so many fascinating things. He writes, the world does not just sit there as a sacrament. It must be made to operate as a sacrament. And this only Christ can do because he's conquered Satan, in fact. In Christ, the mundane, the ordinary world is consecrated. And this, Fagerberg writes, can go and be transcribed, transferred, translated onto each of us personally, which liturgy does when it unites us to Christ's symbolic action because his liturgy wields efficacious signs called sacraments. Continuing, he argues that the church too participates in the symbol symbolizing of the world church participates and what christ is doing bringing things together these disparate things seem disparate so they have meaning so they point beyond themselves to the logos thus in the liturgy we're enabled to see the world anew completely unlike the non-liturgical person remember in schmemann's telling of the fall the world became an end in itself well when, through Christ, we are freed from such idolatry and the world began begin to be a theophany, truly, sorry, let me rephrase this. When we're freed through Christ, freed from this ideal, idolatry, the world can begin to be a theophany. It can be truly symbolic. Okay, and here it is, I'm going to conclude. Hopefully now you can see why Kavanaugh wrote, could write, liturgy is doing the world as it was meant to be done. Liturgy brings everything together, uniting form and content, matter and spirit, God and man. The liturgy, as I just said, symbolizes. You can see then that liturgy, the mass, is not some strange ritual that we do that's so disconnected from ordinary life, nor is it simply food that prepares us to go out into the non-liturgical world. Rather, the Mass shows us reality, shows us a glimmer of the kingdom come when God will be all in all. The Mass is the world done right. It is if we see, if we have the eyes to see, the full vision of what we already see shining forth in the world. And yes, fed by the sacraments, we do go out into the world and help in this mission in symbolizing once again. Okay, let me conclude here with a few specific 
examples of symbols in the liturgy. Okay, so when we kneel, we kneel in submission and we participate in Christ kneeling in prayer. Thy will be done, not my will. Thy will be done. It is humility. It is, in this, in this act of kneeling, it is humility. It is submission, not simply emblematic of it. And this is this profound act that's counter to the fall, which is a contradiction of two wills. When we prostrate ourselves before the Lord, something that doesn't happen very often in the masses, um, but for example, when there's an ordination, um, when we do this, we are, we are lying before God in the shock of Christ's death and also in the acknowledgement of who we are before him, who he is. It shows us our inadequacy. Falling on our knees, not just being on our knees, but falling onto our knees is man in supplication. Joseph Ratzinger writes, Worship is one of those fundamental acts that affect the whole man. The whole man acts in worship. The Desert Fathers, writes Ratzinger, this is really fascinating, had a saying that the devil has no knees. The devil has no knees. Quote, the inability to kneel is seen as the very essence of the diabolical. Whew, that's profound. The devil cannot symbolize. He cannot bring together. He cannot submit. Another posture we do in the Mass, we stand. Standing is a posture of both victory and reverence. It's an eschatological orientation because we're already looking towards the victory when the kingdom comes. Sitting, which we do a lot of in Mass as well, is a posture of recollection. Hence, we sit during the homily. Okay. Man was made as a worshiping creature. And while in this life we're broken, and our whole lives do not symbolize this, but in Mass, we do. In Mass, we learn what kneeling, standing, other actions really mean. We learn how to unite matter to spirit. The body learns to worship, and in so doing, is fulfilled. Lastly, we must end with the Eucharist, for it is the source and the summit of the Christian life. In the bread of the blessed sacrament, we fully commune with Jesus Christ. This is the true symbol for the bread is perfectly united with Jesus Christ. The blessed bread fully participates in that which it points to Christ. This is a taste, an encounter of what every encounter of reality was meant to be and one day will be when the heavenly city descends and we live by the light of God. John the Revelator writes of his vision, then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb to the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall no more be anything accursed. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. The night shall be no more. They need no light or lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This, what we're doing now, is a foretaste of this. The liturgy is life fully lived. It is the world done right. It is anticipation, an anticipation, a foretaste of the kingdom come. The liturgy is a school of holiness. And in terms of what we've been talking about tonight, think about this in terms of perception, of vision. 
the liturgy teaches us to see reality as it is. And we could also say participate in reality as it is. To see it, to live it sacramentally, full of meaning, and in terms of unity. It gathers all things together, symbolizing. You can see up on the slide, I have a, a cover of a book. Highly recommend this book if you want to read more about having, as, as Father Harrison calls it, the sacramental worldview. It's a totally accessible book, uh, nice short chapters, really good. Okay, in conclusion, my last sentence, let us open ourselves to Christ who gives himself in the Eucharist and wants to heal our fragmented self and our fragmented perception so that we can symbolize the world for the life of the world. And that is it. And I look forward to continuing this conversation when we talk next week, or not next week, next month, about uh, time, the Sabbath, and um, the liturgical calendar, which all relates to this sacramental reality. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Andrew. What a wonderful uh, time you offered us from mediation to symbols to the Eucharistic life. Uh, so we look forward to the following sessions. Maybe just a couple of questions that will come from me uh, tonight, and maybe we can speak a little longer before we um, leave our attendees with some discussion and reflection questions that they might want to um, to to look at together with one another in their parishes or at home with people whom they might have invited to watch this lecture um, with them. Um, so you explained earlier on that to see the world sacramentally means that everything speaks of God. Why is sometimes so hard to see that? How can you ex how can we expand our vision of the world? Yeah, that's a great question, <laughs> and and one that that you know there's there's so many answers and responses, and it's sort of this great mystery. But um, well, obviously, the simple one is by attending mass and mm -hmm. and and paying attention. So part learning to see in the mass and what's happening in the mass is is really really helpful. Um, and then and then what's so important about this, of, and, and you know, I'm trying to get at too is that when we begin to see and we recognize what's happening in the mass. So when we receive the Eucharist, which is this amazing mystery, God giving himself to us in this simple little wafer, right? That's what we see. We see a wafer, but it's God encountering us personally. When we recognize that this isn't absolutely unique. Yes. There's nothing like it in one way because nowhere do we encounter Christ so fully, but in another way, Christ is doing this to us are showing himself to us in the world, right? So we see that God's wanting to give us in these lowly ways, give it, give us himself. So I think that that's one way. I, I think in another way is, is learning to see the world, not as something we stand over and how can we use it? We, we we're so often pragmatic in how we come to the world. And so we look at a tree and we say, Oh, maybe I could cut that down and, make a cabinet out of it or something, which, which is kind of neat in its own way, but, but to let the tree speak for itself to, and okay, this sounds funny, right? But to, to, to sit before God's creation in wonderment. Mm -hmm. So to learn to have a posture of wonder and, and so often the world just flies by us. And uh, I'm, I'm reading or rereading a book right now by um, GK Chesterton. And it's, it's a novel and it's called man alive. And, and G.K. Chesterton has the silliest, most ridiculous books. And they're just so funny. And he turns everything upside down. And, and in this book, Man Alive, this character is trying to teach people to see the ordinary. And, and, he, and he keeps saying, this is sort of lines, paraphrase. He says, you don't really notice something until you've seen it 1,000 times. The 999 times you've seen something or done something, you don't really realize what it is. And then on the thousandth how do you even say that time <laughs> you finally see and, and you begin to, to see what's out there. So come to the world with a sense of wonder. I, I think that's so helpful. And then as I, as I, I was, I was saying in, in the talk, 
I, I think liturgy can be a type of training in this too. Uh, sorry, liturgy. <laughs> uh, literature can be a type of training in this. So when we begin to read and read beyond the words on the page, everything in a page is written symbolically, has meaning. So when we can take that idea of coming to the world and say, look, it, God is somehow saying something to me here. And, and often what he's saying is transcending words. So we don't have to walk away from it and say, God is saying this. But no, you know, we're having this, this encounter, um, this communion uh, with God through these things. So learning to be still. And then I guess the other way, of course, is in a practice of prayer. And I think, you know, prayer is difficult again, because we're pragmatic, but when we can learn to be still before God, uh, adoration uh, of the blessed sacrament, to be still, to be quiet, to let God be God. We always want to tell God what he should do for us, um, but to let God be God. And that's the posture we need to have in the world, the way we engage with others. What, where, where is God? God is present here somehow in this moment. And, um, and one of my, uh, I guess I could say one of my favorite, my, this guy I've been reading a lot of lately, a guy named uh, Father Luigi Giussani, a, a fellow Italian. <laughs> um, uh, he says, if you don't encounter God every minute, if you can't recognize that God is somehow present, there's, there's a problem. Um, so that's what we have to learn to see reality, to encounter it. So that's a very long-winded response. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir, very much. I do appreciate it. I think um, as a Franciscan, uh, when we you say something like see God in everything, God speaks to us in everything, uh, you know, that strikes me very, very deeply. Francis saw God in all creation in a particular way in the human person, but really in everything that surrounded us. And he will stare on an element of creation and say speak to me of god and so and i think there is a gift and the gift is that everything is approached as a gift everything surrounds us as a gift from god to us in a very personal way that god wants to be with us in a particular way at a particular moment through a particular mean or creation what it is you know, the, the beautiful fields or another human being in front of us. And so I love when you quote Hopkins because of all Jesuits, I think he's the greatest Franciscan uh, in the way that he <laughs> speaks um, about God and creation and that sense of inscape that he uses. So I, um, it really touches me on a personal level and I, I can see it and invite people to be open to see God's goodness and and to know that everything is a gift that he wants to give us in the good and in the most challenging times and aspects of our lives. And that aspect of sitting back and contemplating and listening um, is truly really the way that we receive the gift. Um, That's so, great. Uh, let me just add one thing, since you, you said it so well, <laughs> is the language of gift. Yes. And and so on one hand, I said to have this posture of wonderment, to look at the world of wonder. Mm -hmm. The other side of wonder is gratitude. Yeah. Uh, and when we, when we recognize life and existence and everything around us is a gift, mm -hmm. then, then the, really the ultimate Christian posture is gratitude. And when we have that, that orientation of thanksgiving, we can begin to see w the world as it is. And of course, the Eucharist literally means thanksgiving, right? It is the great thanksgiving. And so if we can be thankful, uh, Alexander Schmemann, the, 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 the scholar, the Orthodox theologian I mentioned earlier, he says, anyone who can be thankful can be a Christian. And I think that is so profound because that is the, that is the mark of, of the Christian gratitude. So yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned about the liturgy as a remedy for the fall. Um, so we need to the liturgy to help us see as God sees. Uh, can you elaborate on this a little further? Yeah. Well, on, on, oh, there's so much. So I'm probably going to forget the half of the question again once I start talking. But, but or some of the things I want to say. But I think one of the things is what it highlights is that we're worshiping creatures. We're meant to be giving thanksgiving. And, and, and we ourselves are gifts, which also means we're meant to gift ourselves back. So we recognize all of this. 
it's it's a, a transformation of how we see things. But the liturgy, um, the, the liturgy does a couple things. One, of course, it's sacramental, so that's something deep within us. Uh, but it's not magic. We have to open ourselves. God never never violates our freedom, so we have to be open to to the encounter that's presented to us. But then also, as I was saying, when we begin to look around at the liturgy, everything's rich in symbolism from color to actions and so forth. It, it, it's one big symbolic action from how the priest walks into the mass, um, from, from the smoke, from the candles, uh, smoke meaning incense, from candles and so forth. All of this is deeply symbolic. And so when we begin to see, wait, this isn't just silly stuff that we do. Um, no, there, there's a meaning for everything that's happening, for every action. Um, the, the, the reason why, as I talked earlier, we kneel or why we stand or why there are these colors, they all mean something. So when we begin to, to turn our perception towards reading what that means, we're also, in that intellectual way, learning this, how to read reality too, outside of the mass, right? So out there, it's also symbolized. It's just not so obvious. And for, for in mass, the symbols have been, in a way, put back together for us. And, if, and, and you know what? And, and then they're rich. So you can ask your priest and he'll explain it. But there's also multi-levels of depth to these symbols too, right? But as we come to understand that and we see that everything has meaning, well, that now enriches us to go back out into the world to see things. I think I kind of lost a little bit of the second half of the question. What, what was that again? Uh, we need to the liturgy to help us see as God sees. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that, and so yeah, it, yeah. So it, yeah, so it's it, it's seeing the world as God sees. Well, the whole world is meant as communion with God, and um, and that's that's the whole story. Everything is God, uh, as I said, wooing us to Him. So if we can turn and see life and see others as well, not just creation, as, as you say, the face of the other, um, that's how we're meant to see. Everything is communion. The point of the mass is to draw us into the divine life. Um, the point of the world is to do the same thing. The mass is that it's the most heightened, most powerful way. Very good. I will ask one more question before I let you go tonight. Um, a sacramental view teaches us that nothing is ever an end to itself, and you um, explained that a little bit. We often don't get stuck in a rut where we just are doing things for the sake of doing things. Um, how can we break out of this view? How can we help our attendees um, do better than just do things for the sake of doing it and getting stuck in that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, and in some ways, it's I guess what it's, it's what I was saying earlier, slowing, slowing down, um, pausing. When you look, uh, at, I mean, a great example for us who are, are married or for religious or priests where you have spiritual children, those of us have biological children is, these aren't objects. These are real subjects before us that have otherness. They're not me. And there's an encounter there that, breaks me out of myself or hopefully should so this this reminder of, of reality is not me it's me participating in it and bumping against these things so so to sort of to stop myself sometimes and listen uh, I, I think of cardinal Seurat who, who talks about um, the most powerful things occur in silence god moves in silence and being and I think about that not just in terms of listening, but also in being still and watching and letting the things be. And I, I suddenly can look at my, my wife and, be, and look at her and say, oh, she doesn't just serve me. <laughs> She's her own unique person loved by God. My children aren't just little fun things to, to spend time with. They are these unique uh, people that are communing with God in their own way. And it breaks me out of this inward gaze to begin to see this profundity, this profoundness of God uh, around me in the other. So, yeah, slow down, learn to listen, um, break out of yourself. Stop, as my, my dad likes to say, don't don't navel gaze, don't look at your own belly button. You know, uh, look look beyond yourself. 
and, uh, and, and let there be an encounter and let, let the other be before you as the other, not as something you use, but as something that, that can deeply transform you um, and change the way that you see and, and lead you towards God. Thank you. And I want to praise our attendees too, because I think one way in which we can enter more deeply into the liturgy is to learn more about it. And here you are tonight, you know, listening to a wonderful lecture, spending a Friday night uh, trying to learn more about what is it that we're really celebrating in our faith and, um, and to come prepare to the liturgy too, maybe spending a little time uh, doing the readings before we attend Mass or um, finding a little time apart of silence to, to try to meditate on some aspects of the Mass so that things don't come out of nowhere, but you're there uh, giving a little more of yourselves before you entering into the mystery. So maybe that, along with what Andrew shared, could be a little helpful there. Mm -hmm. there there's a great book um, by Peter Kraft, mm -hmm. um, and it's called Soul Food. And yeah. it has all the lectionary reading, not all the lecture, all the Sunday re lectionary readings mm -hmm. with reflections, the, the Psalm, uh, the Old Testament, I think that's the Psalm, maybe not, the Old Testament, the, the letter, and the gospel. And he has these beautiful little reflections. It's a fantastic way to prepare yourself for the Mass, for the readings, and to, to enter into this beautiful, wonderful, loving mystery that we get to encounter. So, Thank you so much, Andrew. And we do look forward to your next lecture entitled A Matter of Time, the Liturgical Year and the Sabbath. And that will be on Friday, October 28th. So the last uh, Friday of October. So we look forward to having you at that time. So thank you again. We will leave you with some reflection questions to ponder and to discuss together at your parish where you have watched this lecture or at home with your own family members and friends. So thank you again, Andrew, for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you on October 28th. Excellent. I look forward to it very much. We'll so. play a final prayer together and we'll then put up the, the questions for you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Father, we thank you for this wonderful evening. We thank you for opening our hearts to the mysteries of salvation through the mystery of the liturgy. We ask this as we gather together, especially this upcoming Sunday as a church community to share in um, your liturgy and to receive you eucharistically that we may continue to grow, to be able to be eucharistic men and women in our world, to receive you and to bring you to all the people whom we encounter. Again, in an act of thanksgiving and gratitude, we offer our prayers to you and we continue to ask for your prayer and protections for all people who are suffering, who might not have been able to be together with us tonight. So we ask that you will um, hear all the intentions in the hearts of the participants and that you will watch over us as we move forward. And we pray all this through the intercession of Mary, our mother, Father Pio, whose feast day we celebrate tonight, and in your son's name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, everyone, and thank you, Andrew, again.